Thanks, uh, Jordan, for leading us thus far. And um, now we will open our Bibles and read this last section of 2 Corinthians. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll pick up at verse 5 to the end of the chapter. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail the test. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. Verse 8, For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This also this we also pray for, that you may be made complete. For this reason I am writing these things while absent, so that when present I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thus ends the second letter to the Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. And so here we are, 12 months, 13 months and 32 sermons later, after having begun this series in 2 Corinthians. For me, this has been an awesome journey. I trust it has been for you as well. As we have looked not so much at the church in Corinth, but rather into the heart of a true spiritual leader, a spiritual leader who was under severe pressure from those whom he loved. I must say, if I had to experience half of what the Apostle Paul would, I would have given up long ago. But Paul doesn't give up, does he? He doesn't give up on these believers who caused him so much grief. He carried on with them with his letters, at least two other letters that we know of, not part of the canon, and the two we do know of. He continued with them, he continued with visits, he continued sending his associates to them. And so over at least a three-year period after being with them, all this in order to correct and build these misguided believers up in the faith. But now as we have read, we see the Apostle Paul coming into land, so to speak, with these last final words just prior his third visit to them. Because we know that that's on the agenda, and we discussed that last week. And here we can see that he has said all that he's going to say. Up to this point, he's been like a convicted criminal, indicted of spurious charges, where the church that was seduced by these false teachers falsely malign him, and charge him as a counterfeit apostle. Hence, the spotlight of this whole epistle is clearly on Paul. And so what he does is he opens his heart, and there we see love and sacrifice, and the endurance of this man of God, which gives to us, modern-day readers, and those historic readers, it should give to us and them, it should have irrefutable evidence of the integrity of his ministry, the integrity of his apostleship, and the gospel that he preached among them, by which many of them were saved. 
And now he has said all that can be said. He has said all that he can be said about himself in defense of the ministry and the Lord's special call upon his life. It's all over. It's all finished. What he does here is he now changes tack. He shifts the focus, as it were, from himself and now challenges his readers to look within. The spotlight is now on the Corinthians to examine themselves rather than them, the readers, examining him. He wants them to look within themselves so that they might see the indwelling Christ, which was the fruit of Paul the evangelist's work amongst them. And as we know, most of the church had repented and turned from being against him. We've looked at that. And um, because they were against him, they doubted him as they were seduced by these false teachers. But most of them had repented. And as the news was brought back by Titus to Paul, who was waiting for news, he rejoiced immensely. We read that in chapter 7. But at the same time, upon hearing of the church's repentance, Paul was not so naive to think that this true revival had involved every single person in the church or associated with the church. He detected that there were still some who were following false teachers or what they were teaching, and there were some were even perhaps living unrepentant and immoral lives in the church. And so because of this, there was nothing left for him to do but warn them that if they remained unrepentant, his next visit to them, he would spare no one, but he would come with God's authority in severity and in judgment, which we read and see in chapter 2 and in also verse 10 as we have read. Now, he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to visit them with severity. He would rather that they judge themselves. But like we are called to do every time we have Lord's communion, we're to judge ourselves, we're to examine ourselves and confess our sins so that we come to the Lord with a clean heart, a pure heart and clean hands. Well, that's what Paul would rather they do than to him coming with his apostolic authority. And so he calls them to examine your own hearts and repent, be your own judge. He has addressed this church up till now, presupposing that his readers were genuine believers who needed to repent of their sin, which we all experience on a daily basis and we're all guilty of. He presupposes that. But like in any church today, Paul again was not so naive to think that there were no false believers among them. He knew that there would be tares among the wheat, as the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 speaks of allegorically. He knew that. So this spiritual self-examination was like a a two-pronged challenge to both false believers and to true believers alike. It was a message to everyone, no matter who was in or associated with the church. In other words, he requests that the whole assembly, the whole church, take a long, deep look within themselves to check out their own spiritual condition. Test, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith, because... That spiritual internal test gives clear answers about a person's eternal destiny. So Paul's concern, like any true pastor, was for all his people to have an authentic faith in Jesus Christ. That was his concern. Any true leader, biblical leader, that's what his true concern or her true concern will be. And he knew that if they were not in and of the faith, that they were still in their sin. 
They would be in danger of hearing the Lord say in a coming day those terribly and eternally damning words. In Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those are horrifying words to me, folks. To people who will stand before the Lord thinking that they are believers, but they are not. Paul also knew that the majority of believers would pass the test. And those who passed the test, he knew that they would rest in this truth, that they truly belong to Christ. And as they looked within themselves and they, and they rediscovered, or they, as they re-examined or examined their own lives, that they would say, yes, Christ is in me because of. This would validate Paul's ministry and his apostleship too, right? Because he was the one who first brought the gospel to them. He was the one who brought, introduced them to the faith in Jesus Christ. It would validate his authentic apostleship. So he challenges and asks them this one final question, test yourselves. Am I a true Christian or am I a counterfeit? Have I been born again or am I only putting up a religious front? That's the kind of question that will be asked when we test ourselves. And so let us, can I ask, take up this challenge this morning also. Because this is a timeless challenge for every church in every age until the Lord comes. Let us take up this challenge so that those who think they are Christians but are not, so that they might be, you might be drawn to faith in Jesus Christ. And those who of us are genuine, we might have our faith in Christ strengthened to a greater maturity of Christ-likeness. That is my goal this morning. And so how we're going to do that is just break this little message up into sections because we're going to first look at... Okay, we haven't got a screen there this morning. I think that's up there. Yeah, genuine Christianity is challenged. And we see this in verse 5 and 6. You see, up to this point, as I've already suggested in the epistle, we have seen how the Corinthians wanted proof of Paul's authority as an apostle, that he was sent to them from God. These false teachers that had infiltrated the church had called and questioned that. And some of them got sucked in by that and, and were swayed to questioning Paul's authenticity. And because of this, has, he has been in defense. He's been like that criminal in a defense stand, giving his own character and witness statements as to his divine calling. For the gospel's sake. That's what, how he has been right through. But now Paul, as I said, reverses the role. The Corinthians now were the ones in the witness stands. And Paul was like a chief prosecutor. They wanted proof of Paul's apostolic authority. Now he wanted proof of their salvation and their sanctification. So how does he do this? Well, we see twice in verse 5, Paul calls the Corinthians to examine themselves and to test themselves. Examine and test are exactly the same word, but he mentions it twice to make sure they get the message of what they have to do and need to do. The word examine or test simply means putting something to the test to find out if it is genuine or not. That's what it means. Just like you might, if you get on odd occasions, have a $100 bill in your hand. You often seen, uh, well, not often, on odd occasions, when I went to America once, you hand over a $100 bill and they immediately hold it up to the light. They look for the watermark in it to see if it's authentic, a genuine one. Well, Paul challenges all the church here, don't look at me any longer. But take a deep look at yourselves to test the genuineness of your faith in Jesus Christ. The word in your text, yourselves, in that verse is particularly important. It's positioned to mean don't test, evaluate anyone else anymore. Don't look at me any longer. But this is to be a personal self-evaluation. Earlier, back in his first letter, Paul called them to stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith, he called them. Now he calls them to examine themselves to see if they are in the faith. 
And both occasions, this in the faith expression is referring to the Christian faith. That is, that body of truth that's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is grasped and laid hold of by sinful men and women through faith alone. In other words, examine yourselves to see if you are genuinely in the faith by testing yourself to see if this body of truth has grasped you. They were called to examine their own lives for evidence of salvation, just like they had been up to thus far, examining and calling to question and asking Paul questions to see if he was an authentic apostle. Now he puts it back on them. Has the truth of the gospel grasped you? You know, that's a real good question. It's not a matter of just believing the gospel with an intellectual assent and believing in Jesus. But has that truth about Jesus and all that he's done so grasped us that it changes us? We'll get into that. My dear people, if there ever was a day that this same challenge needs to be taken seriously, it is today. Amongst professing Christians, we need to ask this question, is the gospel evidencing itself in, in, a, in, a, in a changed life, in a changed worldview in my everyday life? How am I seeing that? So many today are mere professing believers who may have made some shallow intellectual commitment at some point, but if pushed to the test... They would find no love and pursuit of holiness, like as in a genuine believer, as we have in Hebrews 12, verse 14. They perhaps would find no ongoing prayer in their lives, which is a hallmark of every genuine believer. Genuine believers pray, right? They also might find no obedience to the, Christ, the commands of Christ, a hallmark of a believer, as we obey Christ. If we love God, we will obey him. That also may find that there's no, hate, no real hatred of sin and no humbly walking before God. As a matter of fact, some who would call themselves Christians, there may be more pride and arrogance than humility and hatred of sin. In other words, this call to examine ourselves, it's a healthy exercise because when it is honestly appraised, a praise that will either expose your sinful state before a holy God who offers pardon and forgiveness, don't forget that, or to us who are in the faith, it will assure us and strengthen us in the God of our salvation. And this is what Paul expected most of the Corinthian church to find in their spiritual examination. He expected them to recognize afresh with joy, as we've been thinking of this morning, that Christ Jesus is in you, as the text says. You see that? It's a very important statement. Christ Jesus in you. And this is, a, this is the great truth of the gospel. Christ Jesus to be in us is the great truth of the gospel. It's an awesome truth. You know, as we think about that, it may seem to some that this is a very subjective thing. But you know what? It's far more objective than it is subjective. What I mean by that, it is a, a person may call themselves a Christian, they may think themselves a Christian, they may even feel themselves Christian. They may even believe in Jesus, but that subjectivity, a working of the mind alone, or the emotions alone, does not mean that they are genuine Christians. After all, we go to the book of James and we see, see there that the demons also believe and tremble, right? But it doesn't save them. You see, genuinely having Christ in you what it does, it so miraculously transforms a person from within. It's a heart transformation. God does some cardio work on us when we're born again, when we come to faith. He, he performs this heart surgery, as it were, spiritually speaking. We have a new heart. We have a new life. We have new goals, new aspirations. We look at the world and where it is and what it's doing and where it's going 
differently than we used to. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 38, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You see, folks, a genuine believer becomes a channel of God's blessing. Such is this change from within that it soon displays very visible and tangible and objective differences. We know well that Christ dwells in the hearts of the redeemed. Ephesians 3 verse 17 tells us that. And that the Lord Jesus Christ becomes our hope of eternal glory. Colossians 1.27 He's our living hope. He's not a dead hope or maybe a hope. He's our living hope. That's what he will be to the, in, the, in the heart of a genuine believer. Paul could say this to the Galatians. You remember this verse. Paul could say this in testimony of his own uh, position before God. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. So this test that we are being confronted with, that Paul confronts his readers with, will expose visible and ob the objective reality of Christ being in you. In other words, genuine believer will not fail the test. They will not fail the test because he or she will see their obedience to God in action. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That's the, that's the, the linchpin. Genuine believers will see a growth in their holiness. Do you see that? Look back over the last year, over the last five years. Do you see a growth in your holiness? I hope so. And if not, there's some serious repenting and some serious work for you to be doing. We can all have times of backsliding where we get away from the Lord. Well, here's the time to test, not just to sit there, but then to come before the Lord on his throne of grace and ask for mercy and then move on in the things of the Lord. Genuine Christians will also note how their lives are becoming more and more characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5. As you test and as you look within and as you look at your own life, you should be able to see that there's more love in my life. I have a greater love for God and for Christ. I have a greater love for God's people. I have more patience. I have peace. I have more kindness. There's goodness that... I'm involved in that I was never used to be. I'm more faithful, uh, gentleness and self-control. All these things should be evident in the life of the believer. And this will be like an increasing flow out of our lives. Genuine believers will have a deepening love for other believers. 1 John 3, 14 tells us that. In other words, genuine believers will not be self-focused, they'll be other-focused. They will have a positive and visible influence on others. Matthew 5, 16. They will love the word of God and they will prove their love for the word of God by what? By obeying it. John 15 and verse 10. Folks, is this what you see? Is this what I see right now as we begin our personal examination? Paul was confident the majority of Corinthians would find their faith genuine under the spiritual examination. He was confident there. This test would, would assure them of the wonderful blessing of God's eternal forgiveness and salvation. And it would encourage them to continue living out Christ in their lives. And so maybe you think, oh, maybe I haven't been living out Christ as I should be. Well, this is a good time to straighten things out and get right before the Lord so that you can, right? Verse 6 of our text suggests that by passing the test, it also proves something else. As I said before, it proved that it validated Paul was not as useless as some of them had been suggesting. 
their salvation was a credit to his divine calling. But what if you have failed the test? What if you have failed the test? Wow, I don't see any of those things happening in my life. In my life. I'm failed. Yes, weep and mourn will be a good time to do that right now. Be concerned. But let me also say this. This is a blessing as well. This is an unbelievable blessing for you to know that, that you have failed the test. You know, if you were asleep and your house caught on fire and your life was in grave danger, what a wonderful blessing it would be if your neighbour came and threw a stone through your window and woke you up and, and, and no doubt upon waking up and seeing you, uh, danger, you, you would escape for your life, right? What a blessing it would be to be warned of a physical peril like that. And can I say the same relates to this. What a blessing it is to be warned of the spiritual danger that we are in if we fail the test. This blessing of God, this blessing and act of God's amazing grace is offered right now, folks. Because God just doesn't leave us, oh, wow, I failed the test. He offers forgiveness. He offers salvation. He offers a way of escape by his grace. And that is obtained simply by trusting and believing from the heart in the Lord Jesus, that he has bore your sins on the cross, and by believing that your sins have been dealt with forever and eternally by Jesus on the cross, you go free. Amen. And the righteousness of Christ, not your righteousness, because we've got none. The Bible describes our righteousness as in comparison to a filthy rags. Upon genuine heart belief, all the righteousness of Christ you are clothed in. How's that for a great deal? In other words, you're just not some old sinner that's patched up and made a bit better. When God looks upon you, when genuine faith is put in Christ, he looks upon you as one with his Son. Perfected forever. That's why there's such a, there should be, a dramatic change in our lives as genuine believers. And that's why I get really concerned when I see people who would call themselves believers, but there's not too much difference than anyone else who are not believers. Escape for your life, knowing that the only way of being made right before God is through faith in Jesus Christ and repentance towards God. Genuine sanctification should be our prayer and goal. We see this in verses 7, probably going right through to 11 rather than 10. Now, two of the main areas of responsibility for those in leadership in the church should be hinged on two things, prayer and truth. When we come together as elders, the first thing that we do is read the scriptures and the second thing we do is pray. We don't just roar in the air and discuss the finance and then just tack on a little bit of prayer and stuff at the end. No, because we take God's word seriously, and as leaders of this church, we think everything must be hinged on the truth of the scriptures and prayer. And that's what Paul does. Not our idea, by the way. This is Paul's idea. And it's what we see him doing. He, he places this as a priority, as his first priority. What was a prayerful concern for, for the children and the faith. And it was a hallmark of, his, of this apostle's ministry. And, and we see that in verses 7 and verse 9. And, and, and actually, every one of his epistles, he states clearly that he's praying for his flock. I want to read a few of them. Ephesians 1, 18, 19. This is what he prays. That the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. So he prays for the Ephesian believers. In Philippians, he prays for that church. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, and this is what he prays. That your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
Another prayer for the church. In Colossians, he prays for this church in Colossians 1, verse 9 to 11. For God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. You know, one thing I notice about these prayers when I read them and when I look at the, uh, the, the priority of Paul that he had toward the churches, we don't see too many prayers for the aches and pains and, the, and careers and the financial hardships and all those peripheral kind of things that we so easily and commonly prioritize. We don't see that here, do we? Now, I'm not saying that Paul never prayed for those things. As a matter of fact, I know that he did. The, but they're not specified. For instance, Philippians verse, chapter 4, verse 6, Paul exhorts the whole church there. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So we know that he did pray for those things, but it wasn't his priority. His priority was to pray for the saints and for their sp spiritual well-being, for the growth and their health as a people of God. This was the goal of his ministry and the focus of his prayers. And so likewise, here in 2 Corinthians, in our text, he prays what? That they will do no wrong, only do what is right in regard to the repentance and the test that they examine themselves with. You know, see, he, didn't, he didn't want a mere show of repentance, yeah, we're, we're pretty good at that. We can really pretend repentance, right? He didn't want to be a show of repentance, nor did he want them to go on doing wrong or being indifferent and unrepentant. He didn't want them to do that. He prayed what? He prayed that they might do what was right so that when he visited them, he would not have to display his apostolic power and severity that he, God had given him uh, authority to do. He would much prefer seeing them repent in response to the truth. He didn't want to see them repent just because Apostle Paul was the big guy up there or for the sake of unity, okay, yeah, let's just have a democratic uh, vote here and we'll all stick our hands up to go one way. No, no, no. He, he wanted them to, to do the right thing according to the truth. It's a problem of our modern church today. There's a great cry for unity based on a pragmatic approach of everyone being comfortable. In other words, you take a consensus of everyone's views and then you stack it up at the end. Okay, this is the direction we'll go so that we can have unity. No, no. Unity must and can only be based on truth, the truth of the word of God. And so Paul understood that the truth of Christ in them must not be restrained, but it must be allowed to have complete sway. Because once again, he, he, he presupposed that the most of them were genuine, authentic Christians. And so the truth of Christ, Christ in them, it, he must not be restrained. He must be allowed complete sway. Because what does truth do? It sets you free, right? We have that in John 8, 32. It sets you free, and that's a great principle. Truth always sets you free. But it's not your truth or not someone else's truth. It's God's truth that sets you free, folks. Even if it goes against the grain of culture and even religiosity. Truth sets us free. So Paul's longing prayer for them was that their spiritual maturity, he, he longed for their perfection, their being, what does it call it here? Being made complete, I have in my translation. That's an interesting word there. This word complete or, or perfection, I think our old King James Version will have it. A really good word because it has the idea of repairing what has been broken. It was used for, you remember the disciples, Jesus came along and here the disciples, what were they doing with the nets? Mending them. This is the word, the mending there. It was also used in contemporary culture of Jesus' day when the bone was broken, you know. And so they put a splint on it like they do today, and they meant broken bones, the same word. And so Paul longed that they be made complete. 
Because there was a lot of mending to do in the Corinthian church. And can I suggest there's a lot of mending to do in every church? Yeah. Even in this church? Because we're all broken people, right? We're all broken in one way or another. We all have our weaknesses. We've all got hang-ups. We all lack displaying and, and living out Christ in us as we should and displaying the, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not as patient as I, can, I should be and I'm certainly not as long-suffering as I should be. I can go right through all that list and man, I am broken. I need mending, folks. Can I suggest that we probably all do? I wonder if this is how we pray that people might be mended. That the broken aspects of our life might be made complete. Is that how we pray? Do we major on the major or major on the minus? When was the last time you spent concerted time in prayer for the spiritual well-being and the spiritual mending and perfection of the saints. Is our focus and goal on the spiritual well-being and growth of one another, is it? You know, for leaders, this is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. But can I say this is also a heart attitude that should be motivating every single genuine believer. This goal and prayer for one another to know the mending and resetting is an indicative hallmark of one who loves God is in the faith and is in the faith. John, 1 John 4 and 11 says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that will involve a mending ministry. It may be in prayer. It may be coming alongside someone. It may be stepping out of your comfort zone toward other people. And so that's what the Apostle Paul was all about in his ministry. He was our example. And so what we see here in verse 10 is a summary of all he stood for and ever wished and he prayed for. It's a summary statement. He was all about building up. He was never about tearing down like he was being accused of. Never. Even in using his disciplinary power and his authority given to him by God. Even in his severity and his judgments and his rebukes that were required. They were all for building up. They were for edifying. They were for mending of the saints for the glory of God. Is that what you are set on doing and being in this church? Is that your prayerful concern? My dear people, this was, this was, this was the heart of the apostle. Oh, how he, how he loved God and he expressed that love by what? His love for the people, right? And it's right here on this note that he ends this amazing epistle. Genuine love for one another will be displayed, as we see in verse 11, right through to the end of verse 13. He ends it with calling these once recalcitrant believers, those who had maligned his ministry, his character, his preaching ability, who trod on him, had despised him, those who had favoured all the show and the eloquence and the worldly wisdom of false teachers over his weakness and fear and trembling. Even though they had experienced the power of God invading their lives with conviction of sin and faith unto salvation through the apostles' preaching, even though they'd experienced that, they heaped all the stuff on him. But what does Paul do here? In spite of who they were and what they had done, how they had treated them, we see Paul here calls them lovingly brethren. You see that? This is a term of endearment, by the way. Not just a, uh, a relational thing. It's a real term of endearment. It's beloved brethren. Then this dear apostle reiterates his ministry to them in the closing few verses. He gives them five short commands that kind of summarize that all he longs for them. And he tells them, he says, rejoice. These are commands. This is in the imperative form, by the way. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Rejoice. Rejoice in what? Rejoice in what Christ had done in them. This will be a natural outflow of those who are in Christ who are genuine Christians. They will rejoice in, 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 in Christ. I wonder if we do that. 
The next thing he says, be made complete. As we've discussed, set things in order. Don't let things go on and on and on. Mend hearts, mend relationships. Because don't forget, there were, they had a huge potential for divisions among them, right? You go right back to the first epistle and there was a tendency. I have Paul, I have Apollos, I have Peter. There was huge potential and there was no doubt still traces of division among them. And families get separated and this one doesn't speak to that one, etc., etc. You know how it goes down. Nothing changes, folks. Mend it. Broken relationships be made complete. Be comforted. Comfort each other. Especially after problems resolved. You know, it's one thing to apologize and after person's forgiveness. But the work's not done then, you know. It's a great start. But there's a great time of comforting people after that has happened. And to showing that that was real and, and it was authentic, there, there needs to be an ongoing picking up, comforting one another. Be like-minded, a call to unity of mind based on the truth of the scriptures as we are talking about before. Live in peace. Ephesians 4 verse 3, keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Although there will be differences and there will be personality clashes, that's always the case because we're human. Genuine Christians will go all out to forgive and forbear one another. Amen. They should do. Live in peace. And then there comes this promise, this wonderful promise, a promise of God's love and peace to all who obey, no matter what difficulties arise. A wonderful promise. My dear people, the test is to see if we are in the faith. The test will prove one way or another if we're genuine believers or merely pretend ones. To those of us who pass the test, there will be evidence aplenty in our lives because they'll be in sync with the, tr in sync with the truth of Scripture and, and they'll be going out ministering to one another in various ways. May all of us pursue these five commands like never before. May we live out Jesus Christ who is in us. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of this letter, the inevitable question may arise in your minds. How did the Corinthians respond to this whole epistle? Did they all repent prior to Paul's visit? Or did he have to bear the rod and suffer the consequences of his divine reprimand? What was the answer? We don't know for certain. We're not told. I would like to think that they did obey and they did do what was right. One little thing is, we know that there was a collection that came from this area and so it seems to be that the Corinthians did actually pick up and they gave money to the saints in Jerusalem. So whether we can read anything into that, I don't know. But really, we're not told how they responded to this letter. But folks, the most important fact is not to ask or to discover how others respond to God's truth through this apostle. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how we ourselves as individuals or as an assembly are responding. May we do what is right and obey God's truth. Amen. Well, thank you for bearing with me for this marathon task. And uh, what we'll do now is just commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. And I will put this um, benediction up. Because that's the benediction that Paul gives in verse 14. Shall we stand as we pray? Father in heaven, we do give thanks. Lord, we have been challenged, we've been rebuked, we've been had every reason to look within our own hearts and lives right throughout this epistle, but especially this morning as the apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has called each one of us to examine our own hearts to see if we are in the faith. And Father, may we be true to our examination. May, may, we, may we know for surety that we are in Christ or still out of Him. And may we respond accordingly in faith. 
May those who pass the test go on to maturity and obey these commands. So help us to obey your word, Father. Help us to live Christ out in our everyday lives. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.